by the presentation from last year is to adapt some of the suggestions from the audience. So I think just let me know if you think we have improved. So these are the four topics that I will discuss today. I will give a brief um, introduction to translational medicine, what does that mean, and talk about technologies. We'll present some examples of how translational medicine actually has an impact in clinical practice. <clears throat> and then some of the challenges, this is a relatively new section compared to last year. So according to NCATS, the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, translational research can be defined as a spectrum of each stage along the path from biological basis of health and disease to intervention of individuals and the public. And they put this diagram where the patient is the center and they highlight basic research, but there are different aspects involved in what is under the term of translational research. The, the main idea behind translational research is to cover a gap that was very obvious um, until relatively recent. So one of the spectrum you have basic scientists, they do basic research, mechanistic research, trying to understand the basics of biology, led mostly by physicists. And the other part of the spectrum you have clinical research led by physicians with the paradigm being a clinical trial, which epitomizes the you know, backbone of clinical research. There was very little communication between both. So this uh, concept of translational research tried to link both ends of the spectrum so that PhD and basic scientists know a little bit what's needed in clinical uh, arena to improve the management of patients. And the other way around, clinicians or trained clinicians like myself have a little bit of idea of what's, uh, you know, the technologies and what we can use from basic research to improve the management of patients. So which are the implications of translational research. First and, first and foremost, and this has been highlighted by the NIH, is that it is patient-oriented research. So research conducted with human subjects, and they underscore materials such as tissue, specimens, etc. So we use tissue samples for humans or blood samples to understand what's going on, um, even though then we can use other models, but the, 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 you know, the critical thing is to work with human samples in this case. The source of knowledge is uh, the biological basis of the disease. We need to understand what's happening so we can use that to uh, develop tools, diagnostics, prediction biomarkers to improve clinical outcomes. Uh, there is always a focus in patient management. So the paradigm or an example of uh, translational research question would be, so um, can I develop a biomarker that help me predict, predict which patients would respond to seraphonid? And this is important because if I know the patient that would respond to seraphonid, I can spare the side effects with patients that would not respond to seraphonid in HCC. There is a huge uh, impetus to develop uh, sample repositories, collecting tissues and blood from patients so we can uh, work with large number of samples connected with well annotated data from these patients. So if you want to have a good biomarker or prognostic biomarker, you need to know the outcome of the patients and what happened to this patient over time. And then the importance of modeling human disease in this uh, overlapping concept of personalized and precision medicine, which essentially uh, deals with the fact that we're trying to tailor the interventions based on the characteristics, the individual characteristics of the disease. There's also a relevant uh, angle of transfer of knowledge, development of uh, intellectual property and new devices, etc. And it's very transversal. That explains why myself, as a initially trained MD, even though I did a PhD afterwards, I, I deal with uh, transversal research or other PhDs like Andrea Brandt here in the division. She's a PhD, but he knows a lot about what are the key issues in clinical management of hepatitis C. So another definition that I like a lot about what's personalized or precision medicine is that a concept that comprises a study of patients as biological individuals, allowing customization of medical interventions according to their unique genomic background, which encapsulates the notion that one size fits all is not working anymore, especially in cancer. But there are new definitions coming out. So you have precision medicine, personalized medicine, and now um, Eric Topol, which is a great uh, presenter and a strong Twitter advocate, released this review in Cell a couple of months, well, a month and a half ago, introducing the concept of high-definition medicine, which is another twist of the definition that doesn't change much to what we know, but just by adding uh, the relevant of big data in, in how we can model disease in, in humans. 
So let's go to a practical scenario. So this is the BCLC algorithm that classified HCC patients, hepatocellular carcinoma patients in different stages, and allocates a given uh, treatment iteration based on the different stages. So stages are allocated based on the number of tumor nodules and the size of tumor nodules and the symptoms of the patient. All clinical parameters or um, parameters that can be assessed using radiology. But we and others have demonstrated that tumors, despite being in the same clinical stage, are very different at the molecular level. For example, this study conducted a while ago. Um, the reference is wrong. It's cancer research 2008, by the way. Uh, we know that patients, resected patients with hepatitis C-related HCC, uh, they can classi be classified according to the gene expression in different classes. So they're not exactly the same. Also, we know that these classes correlate with outcomes. So if your tumor belongs to a specific class, the likelihood of the tumor recurring earlier is higher than if it doesn't belong to this class. None of this information is incorporated in the management of HCC patients so far. We have more data. This study was done by Sara Torrefilla very recently. They analyzed multiple nodules of the same individual. You know that patients with HCC can present with multinodular disease. And those patients within the line criteria, meaning less than three nodules, less than three centimeters are candidates for liver transplantation. So when you analyze the different nodules within the same individual, and you do genomic analysis, in this case, a separate to look for chromosomal aberrations, you see that when you compare two nodules of the same patient, in some cases, there is a very nice correlation of the alterations of the tumors, meaning the tumors are essentially the same. One tumor is a metastasis of the other tumor. But from other patients, the correlations was, were very poor. So you have a patient with an HCC, for example, two nodules, and we call it an HCC, multinodular HCC, but essentially you have a patient with two different HCCs based on the molecular characteristics. And this is not accounted for when you treat the patient currently. The, uh, let's say, explosion of translational medicine, and in particular translational oncology, happened in the early 2000s. So in the 60s, uh, a brilliant researcher called Peter Noel discovered uh, the what's called the Philadelphia chromosome, which is a translocation of chromosome 9 and 22 in patients with CML. It's very prevalent. Almost all patients with CML have this translocation. And the outcome, the consequence of this translocation is that you generate a new protein, a fusion protein called pcr ADL. This fusion should not be there in normal conditions. And it has, let's say, aberrant, aberrant function. So it induces proliferation of the lymphocytes. So in the early 2000, uh, a group of researchers, Charles Sawyer was involved, found that this compound, natinib, was able to antagonize the biological effects of this fusion protein. So they, they ran a clinical trial where they treat patients with the conventional, CML patients with the conventional therapy and patients with imatinib. As you can see, the response, cytogenetic response of three months was hugely and significantly different in patients receiving Glivec. Imatinib is called Glivec, the, the commercial name. It was, this was mind-blowing at the time. So you have patients with cancer, you give a drug, a single drug, and you get this, you know, type of Actually, Time Magazine at that time had this cover. There is new ammunition against war, uh, in the war against cancer. You have Glivec, it's fantastic. You get outstanding responses, but then, people start to realize that hematological malignancies are much less complex than solid tumors. So they tried to apply the same concept in, you know, lung cancer, breast cancer, and it was not working so well. It was working, but not so well. So five years later, the news suggested that I mean, we, were, we were very excited at the beginning, but things seem to be a little bit more complicated than we initially anticipated. Another example of how uh, knowing the pathogenesis or the molecular mechanisms of the disease can impact what we do with patients. So most of you know that carbamazepine is an anticonvulsive and is the main cause of two very severe potential uh, life-threatening conditions, two skin reactions, Stephen Johnson's and TEN. Based on previous studies using human samples, we know that there is an <coughs> HLA type, this specific that is highly prevalent in nations, that increases the ratio of, this is the risk of having this complication by 1,000 times. So this researcher, a number of years ago, what they did is they took patients that were candidates to receive carbamazepine, and they grouped them based on the HLA type. If they, had this, if they didn't have the HLA type, 
they were treated with carbamazepine because the risk of developing this skin reaction was very low. If they did have the HLA type, they said, okay, you know, you're at high risk. Maybe it would be a good idea if you take a different medication for your, um, for your uh, epilepsy. <clears throat> the final result is none of the patients that received carbamazepine developed these skin complications when the expected ratio was 0.23, we expected 10 of them to have this very dangerous complication. Just an example with knowing the basis of the disease, you can intervene to prevent significant complications. So let's talk a little bit about the technology because this is essentially what have, would have changed the field significantly because now we can look at things in a way that was impossible 10, 15 years ago. And for those of you who are not familiar with sequencing and, and these type of things, a very, very uh, you know, quick and basic reminder of the central dogma of biology, you know that our genes are coded into DNA. It's a long sequence of nucleotides that is transcribed into RNA, and this is translated into protein, which is the final effector of the product of the gene. It does the function. It is a little more complicated than that. So this is the DNA. This is the part of the DNA that will end up being a protein, but then other, let's say, elements of the gene that impact in how the gene is expressed or the final product of the gene. For example, yeah, here the gene in red you have the exons, which is the final part of the gene that will produce a protein, but you have introns, and these exons, these are non-coding regions, so will not code for a protein, these exons can be combined differently. So you have different forms of the same gene. It's called alternative splicing. So from the same sequence, you have different products. And these regions, the promoter regions, the enhancer, the sciences, are regions that control the expression of the gene. So without modifying the sequence of the DNA, you can change the product and the amount of product by modifying these different components. So when we talk about DNA, the, the major alterations are, as you know, DNA mutation, which is changes in the sequence of uh, nucleotides. As you know, the nucleotides are um, grouped into triplets <coughs> called codons that code for a specific amino acid. There are four potential bases, and there are 64 potential of these triplets. The code is degenerate, meaning that different triplets can code for the same amino acid. For example, as you can see here, these four different triplets can code for serine. When talking about mutations, there are some properties of the mutations that you see every time in papers that describe these mutations that are relevant. For example, whether the mutation is synonymous or non-synonymous. A synonymous mutation means that the sequence of DNA, of, sorry, the sequence of the product, the final protein, the amino acids, would not change. For example, you have mutation here. The DNA is different, but they both code for serine. So the final product protein will be essentially the same. The other concept that is very relevant is whether the mutation is damaging or non-damaging. A dam damaging mutation means that the change in the sequence that induces a change in the final protein changes the function of the protein. That's because maybe the mutation is in the kinase domain or in the site where the protein binds to another protein. Whereas a non-damaging mutation is a mutation that despite changing the sequence of amino acid is in a, in a structurally benign uh, domain. So it's not uh, significantly relevant. Let me give an example and talk with a, and deal with a final concept of mutation that is critical, whether a mutation is germline or somatic. Germline mutation means that all the cells of the body have the mutation. Where somatic is that not all the cells have the mutation. The best example of a germline mutation is sickle cell. So you have the normal sequence of hemoglobin, you have the basic with sickle cell. They have just one single nuclear change, just one. And this change impacts the, the RNA that is transcribed, that is different in the normal and in the sickle cell. The amino acid that is uh, translated is different, so the final protein is different. The final protein is the hemoglobin. All the cells in the body of sickle cell patients have this mutation, but since hepatocytes don't express hemoglobin, they don't care about this mutation. Only the cells that express the mutation will be affected by that. And that change in the conformation of the hemoglobin induces all of it's the physiopathological basis for all what happens with these patients. In cancer, it's different. So mutations in cancer are somatic. So the tumor has mutations that are not present in the non-tumoral part. And that's what makes easy for us to detect them. 
there was a big interest in the early 2000s to sequence the whole genome. It was thought if we know the sequence, we know the genes, we can, you know, uh, have a perfect map of what's going on. But as I told you before, genes, the sequence of genes is not everything. There are other components that modify the final product of the proteins. What is remarkable is that the genome product, the genome project was released in uh, 1999. It cost almost $3 billion. And now you can, anybody can sequence his own genome for $1,600 in 24, 48 hours. So the, the technological advances is huge. No question, in 2010, <coughs> Science Magazine, every year at the end of the year, reports the 10 achievements, scientific achievements of the year. 2010, out of the 10, four were directly as a consequence of these new sequencing technologies that allow to sequence the whole genome or significant parts of the genome. So the application of this in cancer is the, these two major consortia, the ICDC and the TCGA. So these two consortia, they, they funded by government, they say, okay, let's do the sequencing of at least 500 tumors of all tumor types, breast, prostate, liver, etc. By knowing that, we will know which are the most prevalent somatic mutations, and maybe we can do something about it. So these two initiatives have, have finished already, so we have data and this available for 500 tumors of most of the most prevalent tumor types. But still, since not everything is coded in the, in the genes, we don't have all the answers. So we talk about mutations in the DNA sequence. Let's move a little bit to RNA, which is this next uh, product of DNA transcription. And the model, the paradigm in which we approach gene expression changed as a result of the development of new technologies. So 30 years ago, people were interested in their genome interests. So I work on KRAS, so I do everything with KRAS, so I analyze the gene, the structure, the function, I knock it down, I overexpress, so I know everything about it. Now, with the new technologies, you can look at the expression levels of 20,000 genes. You have a more blur picture, so more dense, but more you know, distant picture of what's going on. So you can have some candidates that may be interesting. This guy seems to be Wally. Mm -hmm. But then you have to go and validate them to make sure that what you have there is what you really are looking for. And there's a very critical concept that is missed most of the times, is that correlation does not imply causation. And that is very important. The fact you have a correlation with a huge outstanding p-value doesn't mean that that is directly causing the effect that you see. And that's why you need experimentation to modify what you see and see the, the true impact or the consequence of those changes. <coughs> so the gene expression boom started 15 years ago with gene expression array. So gene expression array is a platform where you have probes. Probes is a sequence of DNA complementary DNA that will hybridize for the, by the, the rules that you know of complementarity between bases to your given sample. So you have your sample that is labeled. You take your sample for you know, a tumor or a cell line. You label it. You put a marker. And then you hybridize with your array. So what you get is the number, the amount of your sample that hybridizes to a specific sequence. Since you know the specific sequence, you can tell that OK, this is albumin. I have a lot of albumin because I get a lot of light, because a lot of molecules hybridize to my albumin, compared to other conditions where I have less light, less amount of albumin. And you can do this with the 20,000 genes <coughs> available. But let's put, put an example. Wow. <clears throat> so and this is real data. Uh, we have a drug that we're interested in. It's called ADHC. We're interested to know which is the effect of this drug in HCC. Mechanistic effect. So to understand a little bit how this drug may work to kill HCC cells, what we do is we plate, this is a liver cancer cell line, we plate the cell line and we treat it with a drug for one and four hours. And at one and four hours, we extract the RNA and we compare the RNA between control, one hour, and four hours. So this is a basic, very basic experimental design. When you get the array data, the gene expression, what you get generally, and those of you who have worked with bioinformaticians have know this very well, that you get an Excel file with a list of genes that goes up to 20 something, 20 some, something thousand, and your different conditions, times zero, times y, times four, etc. And the, the key issue is how to get information from this gene list. 
this is the, the, the most the, the difficult part. And that's why your translational abilities need to get into. So I'm going to explain you four approaches that are very common that you all see every time when you read these type of papers that are extremely simple but very informative. The first one is principal component analysis. And the, the notion be, behind this approach is to uh, reduce the dimensionality of the data. What I mean by dimensionality of the data is it will be from 20,000 genes. Let's go to three, four um, pieces of information that generally is combination of genes that explain the variability of my experiment. We have here one component, principal component one, principal component two. And the samples are grouped based on their location according to these two components. As you can see, this is the control. This is one hour after the, my AD80, and this is four hours after AD80. We have replicates because we have to make sure that we don't get biased. In that sense. <laughs> so each dot represents composite data that you get to define? So each dot represents the value of each of my conditions with respect to this component, which is the composite of the data. So each principal component has maybe uh, gene 1, gene 3, gene 7, gene 8, multiplied by a you know, correcting factor. And that's done by the, problem, by the analysis itself. There is nothing that you can say what's the principal component. It's a combination of different genes. That, that, that what they define that is that they capture the highest variability. So present back upon the next thing, I want to know which are the genes that are differential expressed between my conditions. And this is generally uh, represented with what is called a volcano plot. Volcano plot represents in the x-axis the magnitude of the change, so the fault change, and the y-axis the significance of the change, what it means essentially p-value. For example, in a clinical trial, um, the final product and the final representation is generally maybe a kaplan mayer curve. And um, Cox modeling analysis to see if the drug that I'm testing is independent predictor of outcome. And the pro so the, let's say the metrics of that analysis is the hazard ratio and a p-value. The p-value tells you how confident you can be about the hazard ratio of you know, improved survival in the case of clinical trials. Here is similar. You have a p-value. In this case, it's an FDR. It's a, it's a little different p-value, but it's a p-value, essentially. And this, you have here the magnitude of the difference. In our case, we have that AD80 after four hours, we have a down regulation because the fault change is negative, down regulation of mid with a very high p value. The next form of representation, so we have PCA, we have differential gene expression. The next one are heat maps. And I'm sure all of you have seen a heat map sometime in, in your life. So heat maps are always represented the same thing. Columns are the different samples, and rows are the different genes. In a way that the color code is also quite uh, repeated, meaning red is overexpression and blue or green is down regulation. So for example, for this gene, in these six different conditions, these three are upregulated compared to these other three with the gene is down regulated. So you can actually tell the computer to classify, to organize, to order your samples based on the similarities of the expression. In this case, it's six genes. But it can be 20,000 genes or the genes that you want to. Actually, when we go back to the classification that I showed you before, these are the HC samples. This is a heat map. So each of the columns is a sample. It's a, it's a HCC tissue. And each of the genes, each of the rows are the different genes. So for example, in this class, this class the beta containing class, all these tumors are overexpression of these genes. And none of the others have overexpression of these genes. This is a way to interpret heat maps. And the last piece of analysis that is also very interesting and very frequent is gene set enrichment analysis. So you have your gene list, you have the differential gene expression, but sometimes it's, it's a little bit um, difficult to get biological information when you see all these genes one after the other. So what's the meaning of all that? How can we get a unified message? So what you do is you compare your experimental conditions to a gene set. And a gene set is a list of genes that have been curated to correlate with specific features. For example, there can be a gene set of activation of wound signal, gene set of uh, failure to respond to estrogens in breast cancer. And there are thousands of these gene sets. So you take your, your experimental conditions, you rank the genes based on the location in the gene set, and you can see that, for example, oh, I have a lot of genes from this gene set that are in my overexpression part of the correlation. So you get a statistic, and you can say how 
and reach is your sample for that specific gene list. For example, in our sample with the AD80 that I told you before, at four hours, we have a very significant negative enrichment. So we have a lot of genes of this gene set that were significantly falling with the down-regulated genes among this comparison, which is consistent with what I told you before about the MIG being one of the top down-regulated genes. So we have the DNA. We talk about mutations in the past. We have the transcription. Then we have the regulatory part, the other, you know, non-coding DNA that also impacts um, expression is what is called the epigenetic code. And the first and more, let's say, the better known mechanism of controlling gene expression is DNA methylation. So what is DNA methylation? It's a, it's a, it's a very simple concept. It's the biochemical addition of a methyl group to a cytosine mostly in the contents of a C, G dinucleotide. Okay? So let's put an example. We have an oh, I'm sorry. So you yeah. didn't actually define epigenetics. Because so uh, you're on a slide. Yes. Well, epigenetics is, uh, let's say, uh, the different mechanisms that control gene expression without altering the sequence of the DNA. We have DNA methylation is one of the mechanisms that can change expression. There are others, there's microarrays, there's acetylation, and I'll mention that in a minute. So essentially, um, how you can impact the uh, function of a gene by controlling the levels of its expression. So let's put an example of DNA methylation. I have the pathocyte. This is the DNA sequence. And we have a couple of CG dinucleotides that can be methylated or unmethylated. It's a let's on off status. The same individual in a muscle cell will have exactly the same sequence because it's the same individual, so the DNA is the same. But the methylation status is different in these specific CPG sites. So there are four uh, bases. So there are 16 dinucleotides. And we're interested in these specific dinucleotides, the one that is, there are others, but this is the one that is mostly methylated. So we expect to see this one in 16 times in the DNA the distribution of these dinucleotides. Well, actually, it's seen one in 100. So there is a significant underrepresentation of CG dinucleotides in the human genome. And this is not random. There's an explanation. They're not only fewer, but they tend to congregate or be located in these specific promoter regulatory regions of the genes. So they're there for a reason, and the reason is to control the expression of the genes. So for example, you know that monozygotic twins, they have the same DNA sequence, right? Well, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so the sequence is the same, the DNA is the same. <clears throat> this doesn't change. You get all, you don't change with the sequence of DNA. A little bit, but let's not get into that. <laughs> uh, but your methylation changes a lot. So when you compare the methylation sites of a three-year-old and a 50-year-old, they're very different. For example, if you smoke, your methylation in your trachea will change specifically for some genes like P16 that are associated with tumor development. So you have something that is dynamic and it can impact gene expression. In cancer, there are plenty of data that suggest that the tumor cells have different methylation patterns than non-tumor cells. And actually, we show that by looking at the DNA methylation sites, you can train a prognostic signature that correlates with outcome, which suggests that methylation is a significant uh, proxy for tumor biology. There are other uh, mechanisms of regulation of gene expression, the epigenetic code that we mentioned before, and the other one is, is histone acetylation. So, you know, histones are the proteins that pack the DNA. Uh, the way that the, the, the DNA is packed impacts if it's expressed or not. So there are many studies that show that in cancer, the, the, the methylation, of, sorry, the acetylation of these histones is different, and that impacts how genes are expressed. Are those things reversible? Is methylation reversible? Yes. Okay. There are drugs actually called histone deacetylases that change that, like panovinostat. You heard about these genes. So. With all this DNA, RNA, protein, methylation, etc., what you get is a lot of data uh, very rapidly, actually more rapidly than you can handle it. We cannot, let's say, assume so many data in, in such little time. 
The good thing is now journals all require that when you present, you, you publish data, original data using these technologies, you have to deposit it so everybody has access to these things. You have different repositories where you can access the data. I think the last time I, I, I checked, there are like, for cancer, like 2 million um, exome sequencing deposited in, in, in the public available repository. So everybody can download the data and mine the data and reanalyze the data. So let's talk about examples of the application of translational uh, studies or genomic studies in clinical practice. So we have this case report in New England, 58-year-old, um, 57-year-old Australian guy that was on vacation in Europe. So he came back, and 10 years after coming back, he died of a cerebral hemorrhage, and he was a donate, he donated to organs, right? The kidneys and the liver. The three recipients died within one month of receiving the organs, okay? And they all died due to the same, you know, the clinical presentation was very similar, fever, sepsis, fever, fever. It's very suggestive of an infectious agent that has been transmitted by the donor to the three recipients. So they did anything that you can imagine in terms of microbiological analysis, everything. There's nothing out. Everything, and everything was negative. But they were concerned, you know, we have this patient that have transmitted something to these three other recipients that killed them, so it's kind of a big deal. So they say, okay, let's, you know what, let's do sequencing. We're going to sequence um, whole genome sequencing, whole transcription sequencing of the samples to so here we find everything, anything. Not based on our prior knowledge of the bugs that we know and the way that we can detect them, but let's see if we see, we find anything new. They did that, and they actually find a new coronavirus, sorry, arenavirus. It was very similar to us. That's why they were able to call it a new virus. They look at similarities, and they found this virus. They went back to the recipient, sorry, to the donor, and they found samples of this <coughs> virus. So it will not change anything, but at least it's a flag, a red flag to say, like, be careful, because at least we have tools to detect these kind of situations. Second example, case report published a uh, six years ago. So it's a, it's a, it's a kid, 15-year-old, that started with a clinical presentation is very similar to inflammatory bowel disease. We have loose weight, abscesses, so it's a complete ordeal. If you see the, the first part of the description of the case is you want to cry. So they did everything, colostomy, adalimula, prednisone. When the kid was four years old, it still was, you know, malnourished, that fistula, they removed colon and ileum, uh, steel fistula, cyclophosphamide, you know, everything. And when you're desperate, they were desperate. They said, you know what? Let's do exome sequence to see if we find anything. This guy, because we cannot do anything else. We're, we're lost. So they found a, now that you know this terminology, germline. So all the cells in this kit had this mutation. Not synonymous, meaning that the mutation changed the sequence of the DNA. And damaging, so the change in the protein was impacting the function of the protein. This is the specific thing that they found. So this is the sequence of the reference, the first one. The sequence this is the sequence of the amino acids. It's not the DNA. It's the sequence of the protein. The second one is the sequence of the kid. And you can see in position 231 here, there's a tyrosine that is different from the germline, sorry, different from the reference for what everybody else has, and also different from many other species. So this protein is very stable across the species. And then you can see here all the different species. Mice, it's very, it's very similar. So you have a change in something that is very similar. The likelihood of that being significantly or being functional is higher. This gene has been associated to a very rare histiocytosis, but nothing to do with inflammatory bowel disease, nothing at all. The treatment for this rare histiocytosis is bone marrow transplant. So they transplanted the kid, and he recovered completely. So this is an example of how, by doing all exome sequencing, you get information that actually changes the natural history of the disease. But you cannot rely on what is known, because this is actually unknown at the time. That's why these tools are so powerful. So was the why, why would you, or why would you choose whole exome it could be. I think they started, <coughs> when the paper was published, it 
when these technologies were out, was starting to be developed. And at that time, whole genome was not as developed as Exome. You know, the complications of whole genome was much more analytic. The analytical limitations are much more you're strict to 1%. sensible to do whole genome sequencing. Yeah, yeah the, the problem is that the annotation of the non-coding region is much less precise yeah. than with the, so the high annotation in non-coding genome you know exactly, it may be regulatory, maybe not, so it's much more difficult to interpret. I think that's the, the main reason. Lucas, a quick question. How common is it that you have a protein that is that conserved? Because you're just, you say, a, you know, that there's a reference homo sapiens sample, but I mean, a lot of variants to exist, right? So it just happens to be lucky that that particular site is you know, very conserved across all species. That Not really. There are many proteins that are highly conserved among species. The, the you know the proteins that are involved to core processes within cell are very similar across the different species. So it's not rare to have such homology in, within a particular species and not cross species. Yeah, across species. And the last example uh, um, is a fantastic story of fusion. So uh, essentially, they um, in Japan they, in 2007 they did a study uh, doing sequencing of patients with lung cancer, and they found a fusion protein. So similar to the ALK, so to the PCR ABL example, they found a protein that was you know when they analyzed the sequence, they compared and said, okay, this part is similar to a uh, protein called EML4, and the other part is similar to a protein called ALK. And this is the fusion product. What's interesting is that the fusion product in this lung cancer patient had the kinase domain, the active domain of the ALK. So uh, EML4, there were few data at the time of what's the role of this protein, it's uh, mm -hmm. modified assembly dynamics of microtubules, there were not much information from ALK. It was known as an orphan receptor, so we didn't, we didn't know the ligand. But there were some fusions described involving ALK in uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So there was a hint that you know, fusions with ALK may be relevant. So uh, they went back to all the uh, samples that they analyzed, and they found that actually there were three patients that had this specific fusion, which was interesting. Uh, and the reason that it was interesting is because when they look other known drivers of lung cancer, like EGFR mutations or KRAS mutations, the patients that had the fusion did not have the other driver mutations, which is relevant to suggest that this fusion was um, significant in determining clonal evolution of this tumor. So they look at other tumor types, like lymphoma, gastric cancer, colorectal cancer. None of them had this fusion. The next thing that they do, they do, so they found a correlation, but as I told you, it doesn't mean causation. So they modify or they introduce artificially this fusion in mice, specifically using a promoter that expresses this fusion in the lung, in the pneumocytes. And they found that the mice that express this fusion develop lung cancer. Moreover, if you treat the mice with an inhibitor of this fusion, you get a response, an anti-tumoral response in the mice. So this was published, everybody started to read this, and everybody started to publish their series on human samples of how many of my patients have this fusion? At this example, there were not a lot of them, but people started confirming the findings. This is another uh, paper in JCA in 2009. Remember, the first report was in 2007. Now, again, it's around 5%, but they could confirm with fish, the translocation, and the fusion uh, involving ALK. The next step, clinical trial. So you know the molecular defect, and there was this drug, chrysotinib, able to antagonize the effect of the ALK rearrangement. Was a phase two trial. The response, partial response of 57%, was so remarkable that the FDA granted accelerated approval of ALK of pricotinib in these patients. And you have the final uh, step of this story. So you have the phase three trial, registration trial, where you um, enroll patients with the fusion. You don't enroll all lung cancer patients. You say, you have lung cancer, do you have the fusion? Yes. Now you're going to be randomized to receive conventional therapy. And the impact in survival was remarkable. This is overall survival, no, sorry, progression free survival, and the hazard ratio was less than 0.5. So the, the, the likelihood was double to survive without progression of chrysotomy. 
which is remarkable. So this is the end of the story. Well, actually, it's not the end of the story. A couple of years later, case report in New England. You have a 28-year-old male with a extreme, I mean, this is the advanced you can get in the States, T4 and 3M1, no more advanced disease as possible. Wild type for uh, EGFR, conventional therapy, patient progressed. Uh, they analyzed for diffusion and, well, they found diffusion, very good news. They started treating with chrysotinib and the patient responded for five months, but after that he got a burst <coughs> progression and was removed for the clinical trial. So the, the researchers collected tissue from the time of the progression and compared it to the baseline because there was sample available of these two um, <coughs> different clinical situations, right? They did sequencing again and they found, and you're familiar with the terminology, two non-synonymous, so there's a change in the sequence of the final protein, damage mutations, the changes in the protein impact, the fusion of the protein, of the fusion. And these changes impacted in how this fusion was antagonized by chrysotin. So chrysotin was not working because the change in the structure of the protein prevented him from antagonizing the kinase effect. So again, another example in this case moment, because now there are second generation ALK inhibitors. But again, you need to look at the you know, changes at the molecular level to come up with solutions to antagonize or, or uh, revert this resistance. <clears throat> so the timeline between uh, discovery of a molecular alteration in a given disease and the time we can actually do something about it has changed. So you have the CML that I mentioned before it was described in 1960 and I believe it was approved in 2001, so 40 years. Whereas the outbreak arrangement story discovered in 2007 and FDA accelerated approval in 2010, so three years only to achieve this um, truly translation of, uh, you know, molecular information into clinical practice. So which are the challenges of uh, implementation of translational medicine? So everything that I told you uh, is based on the fact that you take a biopsy of, in this case, a tumor, and let's focus on HTC because of what I do, and you do the analysis, the sequencing, and you act based on that. So this is an HTC for a section of specimen. This is the adjacent non-tumoral liver. It's erotic, that's why it's so nasty looking. If we assume that the tumor is a sphere, which is not the case, but let's play with that, and then a three centimeter HCC will have a volume of 14 cc's. If it's 565 and it's 15 centimeter, it's 1700 cc's. And you may think, well, 15 centimeters is a large um, HCC, right? It is. <coughs> for a section, it's very large. We don't see that very frequently. For, but for advanced stages, the amount of tumor that a patient with advanced HCC may have it may be well within this range. So the volume, the predicted volume of a biopsy from a 14 gene needle is 0.16 cc's, which represents 1% of the 3 centimeter, 0.2 of the 5 centimeter, and 0.00009% of the 15 centimeter HCC. Now, if we're going to act based on the molecular alterations that we found in 0.0009% of the whole tumor volume, we have to be pretty sure that that represents the complete landscape of alteration that a tumor has, which may not be the case. So we do have a 15 centimeter HCC that was resected in this whole thing here, this is tumor, and this is a little bit of adjacent on tumor tissue that we have. And we did multi-regional sampling, so we collect samples at different regions of this tumor. Actually, you can see microscopically that there are like different nodules <laughs> within this one nodule HCC. But this is one of them. We, uh, we're, we're doing a number of studies, and Boyan and Amanda, Amanda in my lab, is working on that to see if we can understand what's the impact of this intratumular heterogeneity in how we predict response. Actually, we're trying to learn how tumors evolve by looking at this multi-regional sampling. What we, can, what we can see is that in these different regions, at least from a very basic h &E point of view, they're different. Some areas have more steatosis, some areas are poorly differentiated, some areas are better differentiated. This was even more uh, evident in a different case. So resection specimen from an HCC, this is the this is a tumor. Okay? This is a cross-section, it's a macroscopic view. 
and this is the adjacent non-tumoral liver. It's very, it's very easy to identify the tumor, right? But within the tumor, you have this nodule here. It seems a little bit different to the rest, right? It's like a nodule in nodule, a nodule within the nodule. This is the samples that we collected from this individual. Four regions of the tumor and one region of the adjacent. And I want you to focus on this region four. So this is the H and E, a low magnification of this region. There's some artifacts, but it, I don't know if you can see it. There's this area here that are a bit darker purple, but darker purple than the rest of the slime. Now we're going to focus on these, this part right, right here. Okay. So if you if we magnify there. <coughs> What you see is that there are two different cell populations. They are very well demarcated, but this seems like even a little bit of fiber, a little capsule. This is the same individual, okay? What's interesting is when you look a little bit more in detail, the different cell populations are different because it, this has a lot of steatosis that is not present here, but this also has significant higher immune infiltrate. You have this niche of immune cells here, there are other right here. There are some immune cells here, but not as much as here. So if you think about response to immunotherapies, the first thing that you have to have is the immune cells there, because otherwise you can do everything you want with checkpoint inhibition. If the lymphocytes are not there, don't get there to kill the cells. There's nothing to do. So this one, reality hits you brutally in the face. So you have a patient that in that region of uh, 7 centimeter HCC, you have two different cell populations with two different cell immune cell infiltrate, which suggests that may respond differently to treatments. So how do we handle that? How, we, how do, can we account that, right? So one of the things that we've been working on is a concept called liquid biopsy, which is extremely convenient, and the concept is very, similar, very simple. You have tumor cells and you have non-tumor cells. When the tumor cells die, they release the DNA into the blood. Since cancers have somatic mutations, so things that are present in the tumor but not in the adjacent, you can easily identify the things that are different in this read, sorry, in this DNA that is not present in the German DNA. So the good thing about this approach is that you can do it sequentially. So if you want to study heterogeneity in an HCC patient, I don't know the solution, but what will not happen for sure is that you will not biopsy you know, five times the patient every time it comes to the clinic. That's for sure. But you can take blood every time it comes to the clinic. It's much more practical. It's easy to do, and it's uh, realistic. Is it higher yield after they have, like, a taste or a treatment because there's more relief of the... So the, um, the half-life of the DNA in the plasma is around two hours. So if you do a taste, you have a lot of cell death. Um, but if you wait, like, you know, one week, then you have a portrait of the amount of DNA, not as resulting of the acute killing of the cells, but of the remaining tumor that is after the treatment. Actually, this has been used to detect what's called minimal residual disease, right? So you have a patient, this has been done in colon cancer. A patient with colon cancer, you measure the tumoral DNA before the resection and after the resection. After the resection, you do the imaging, there's no tumor on imaging, but you detect reads, tumoral reads. So there's some tumor, residual tumor there that you're not able to identify. And that's very easy to trace with circulating tumor DNA. In addition to that, and this is very preliminary data done in, in by Delian and Carlos in my team, we're trying to do single cell sequencing on circulating tumor cells. So in addition to plasma, to DNA in the plasma, there are some cells that are released in the bloodstream by the tumors. Right? When you do single cell sequencing, you get, and this is principal component analysis, again, as you know, this is to reduce the dimensionality of all the genes that are expressed by the cells. You get all these cells that are very similar to each other, and then you have one cell that has nothing to do with the other cells. Completely different, right? And what's the difference? Well, this cell expresses essentially marker genes of being a patocyte. Albumin, APOH, APOB, uh, SPID1, SAA. So all of the markers of hepatocytes. This is a patocyte in the blood. And it also expresses markers of being an HCC, specifically non-occluding uh, RNA that has been associated with HCC. We have another patient. We did the same approach. We have all these cells, and when we remove these outliers, we analyze the cells, we have monocytes, lymphocytes, what you would expect in the blood. We have these two cells that are completely different to these cells here, and they express, again, markers of being a patocyte, APOH, albumin, SLC2A2, ADH6, etc. 
How should you find, in this particular case, one gene that is different between the two CTCs? So this overexpressed IDF2 unknown um, HCC driver gene that is not expressed in the other. So we can capture heterogeneity in the blood, at least theoretically, and this in this case, which overcomes the problem of heterogeneity in tissue of multiple biopsies. It's an approach, it's suboptimal, but it's a way to try to address this issue. So final slide, and this was a specific request from Scott. So why can I, what can I do as a clinician with all this information? So in my view, this is personal view, most of this is still in research mode. So the application of these technologies is still uh, in research mode because we don't know, um, we get so many information that sometimes it's difficult to interpret it and see how we can apply or implement in a given patient. For the case of HCC, that is what I do, uh, there are um, possibilities of sequencing drug mutations in patients through different mechanisms. And if you're interested, contact the liver cancer program, the clinical team, and Myron Schwartz is leading that. But essentially, it's, it's get your tumor sequence to potential genes that are mutated and that can be, you know, targeted by a given drug. This doesn't mean that every HCC patient should be sequenced at this point in clinical practice because, you know, there is a pathway of, you know, have been shown to be effective. But it's something to have in mind, particularly thinking about clinical trials. There are a number of clinical trials here in Sinai that work with um, enriched populations. So you analyze to find specific molecular alterations like overexpression or amplification of FGF19 or fusions involving FGF receptor 2 and give the patient a drug specifically designed to um, antagonize the effect of these alterations. This is happening now in, in, in Sinai. But it's an example of how we can implement um, you know, translational research is still in clinical trial phase, but it is a way to show efficacy. For other liver diseases, uh, it's uh, a little bit unclear, more unclear to me. I would stick to the extreme scenarios or extreme circumstances that have been published in the literature, like the, the transplanted guy from Australia or the kid with the, uh, you know, mutation in, in that strange gene. But besides these scenarios, I, I cannot see a, let's say, a clear cut example where you can say, let's do sequencing all these patients to see what happens. There's also regulatory issues that need to be addressed in terms of consent and, and, and how you handle this information. But um, I guess we're not yet, not yet there for full implementation, but this would be my, my suggestion. So finally, thank to everybody in the program, my lab, so I've presented data that was generated here. Well, actually, there's an old picture of many new people and old people here, but anyway, and the liver cancer program, because as you know, for translate, you need all the stakeholders be really committed, in the surgeons, the pathologists, because as you can imagine, taking multiple biopsies of a patient when you don't need to do that, it's, it's a pain. So you have to be committed and, and, and believe in what we do. So everybody is, uh, let's say, driving in the same direction. And, I think that's a unique feature of our liver cancer program. That's it. If you have any questions. Thanks, Chris. That was wonderful. Questions? That was great. Are so any, um, any common liver diseases where different variants merit sequencing? Uh, I Wilson, think. For example. But I think they're already. Um, so most of the most prevalent variants are already known. For example, in, in pediatric liver disease, I know there is in cholestatic diseases, there's a lot, of, almost every year, there is a new gene, a new transport associated with a specific, you know, um, disease. But um, I cannot think of any um, specific thing that should be done besides what is done already in clinical practice, like in blue doses. Show how often it's the case that tumors just have a lot of fat in them, more fat than what is in the surrounding liver. Is, is there a molecular explanation for that fat? 
Yeah, so <clears throat> what has been done is that seeing hepatocytes are so metabolically, metabolically active, the tumor counterpart may have alterations of metabolic pathways that can impact in, in how fat is, is being processed and accumulated. The exact mechanisms, I, I'm not aware, and I don't know if there's any, you know, uh, common or recurrent mechanisms in HCC with fat <clears throat> that has been described. But I, I, my thought, my thinking is that, you know, despite the outside of timber is not, uh, has, doesn't have, you know, NAFL or NAS, since the tumor hepatocytes are so weird working and operating, it makes sense that metabolic pathways may be significantly deranged. Hmm. I would assume that, but I, I don't know. I don't know exactly the data. Yes. So the example that you brought up of the 15-month-old child, in a sense they got lucky, kind of, that there was one mutation in a highly conserved area. But I imagine that for a lot of diseases, you might instead have multiple somatic or germline mutations or somatic mutations in areas that are not well conserved and that only together are disease-causing. So it seems like that would be very, very challenging out of the type of data that comes out of this. So how do you go about that? Actually, in the paper of the, the kid, they, they uh, let's say, argue about that. So they had a lot of variants in the range of hundreds or thousands. So how do we do about that? So I think that you explained it very well. They were lucky enough to get to have this protein that is very highly conserved, and, and, and there is a part of gamble in what they did. There's no precedent, so you do the bone marrow transplant with a clear idea of what's going to be the output. So with the others, I don't think there is a clear, uh, let's say, analytical approach to say uh, whether um, to call any of these variants pathogenic per se in that specific individual. So that's one of the challenges and why this is not implemented at full speed, I guess. Yeah, no, it's... I think one of the reasons that it was published because it's it's, a, it's an exception. No, it's 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 a weird thing, but it's very, I think, clear of the, the power of these technologies. Once we're able to, you know, figure out which is the noise and which is the real player in that particular disease. Okay, we'll have to end it here. Thank you again, Thank you.